Welcome and thank you for joining How to Drive Better Outcomes Using Business Architecture presented by Digineer. My name is Jack Thiesing and I will be your moderator today. I would like to introduce today's speaker. Brandon Johnson is a senior consultant and certified business analyst at Digineer. He has over five years of experience in business analysis and business architecture. He has successfully delivered technical and business solutions across a broad range of healthcare contexts and is enthusiastic about working with others to generate creative solutions that solve real world problems. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature of this webinar. Also, Brandon is broadcasting with his webcam. Zoom has options that allow you to change how you see the presenter during the presentation. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Brandon. All right, thank you, Jack, for that wonderful introduction. Yeah, as you mentioned, this is business architecture, driving better business decisions utilizing business architecture. So just wanna start off today with uh, grounding everyone on what exactly is business architecture. There's a lot of different definitions out there and perspectives and can be a little bit difficult to navigate. So I just want to make sure that we have a basic uh, definition of, of how we'll view that today so that we can all be on the same page. So essentially business architecture uh, is a discipline and a practice. It represents holistically the, the multidimensional views of your business, and that can include capabilities, end-to-end -end, um, value delivery, uh, any information being transferred, your organizational structure, and then ultimately it's all about those relationships among those views, uh, it could be your strategies, products, services, policies, initiatives, stakeholders, and so that really gives us a, a broad base, but it gives us an idea of what we'll be talking about today. So ultimately, who should care? Why should I care about business architecture for my business? Why should I care about it personally? What kind of impact uh, would it have on my life in the business sense? So really, uh, it, this does uh, impact a broad scope of individuals. So really it impacts anyone needing help, understanding how does technology fit into their organization? And how do you understand how to support that technology? And how does the business uh, collaborate with technology to ensure that their vision of the future matches where their technological maturity is at this point today? We're actually gonna start with a poll question. So uh, you should see something pop up on your screen. And so this is just to get an idea of where, uh, where you're at today. So this could be uh, the client that you're working at, or this could be um, you know, your, your individual business. So our first question is, does your organization have a business architecture practice? So that's gonna be true, false, or unsure. Thanks to those that I see responding. I'm going to give it another five seconds to get those last minute answers in. All right, I will share the results. Okay. So it looks like we got um, quite a few of you saying true, so that is great to hear. Uh, business architecture is growing stronger uh, in recent years, so that's good to hear. Um, there are still um, plenty of businesses that don't have business, a formal business architecture um, area or you know dedicated team, let's say, at their business, which is totally fine. And we'll talk about how those people can uh, possibly get one started or the types of things they should think about and the benefits they should cons consider as they look to set one up. And if you're unsure, that's actually fairly common as well. There's very large organizations 
who may already have an architecture team, but it's um, tough to determine where exactly they are or where, how they interact or fit into um, your exact work function. All right, so first topic we got here uh, is capturing current state. So if you're looking to set up a business architecture um, department or team, or as sometimes they're referred to as architecture guilds, these are really just teams that are uh, dedicated to developing uh, business architecture models or capabilities or deliverables to provide to the business and technology. And so if you're going to look to get something like that going at your um, business or you already currently have one, this can help you understand some of the approaches that they would take and potentially some ideas or suggestions uh, you may have for improving whatever is currently in place. So really the, the essence of capturing current state, the real question is how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you are at today? So typically when doing business architecture, there are the two dynamics that people talk about often, which is current state versus future state. And future state uh, capture can be quite challenging if you don't take the time to capture where your business and technology are at today. So essentially, if you're going to do that, it need, it's very important, um, let's say that you're starting out, uh, let's say business architecture is not really a mature team at your organization. And so one of the, the real keys that you would have to focus on is what is the value driver? So what is going to add value to your business and who is going to care about this value that's going to be added? So typically uh, in an organization, um, it helps to get buy-in at a higher level as you look to go to map out current state with all of the teams throughout the org um, that may be underneath that leadership's guidance and direction. Um, so really it helps if you can get to the highest level possible to get that buy-in from leadership or management to help them, to help articulate to them what are those items that are being provided by capturing current state so that they can begin to see the value that's going to be provided to their organization and how it's going to help them get to where they want to go at, with their teams and with their strategy. So it really helps for them to start to ask themselves, okay, what's the problem statement? What, what are they trying to fix, right? And so really what you're trying to do is help enable the business strategy and drive towards achieving their business goals. And that's done by facilitating collaboration between business and technology, which we know uh, oftentimes have different perspectives. Um, which is completely healthy and normal. So business is gonna be more, um, uh, they're gonna have different perspectives from technology. So it really takes both of them coming together to provide the full picture. And so that's, that's one value in and of itself is that you're, by capturing what you have for current state, you will be inherently having to um, be kind of that in between the business and technology and have them both come to the table at the same time. So just getting those, those sides of the business to talk to each other and exchange ideas and align uh, is a value in and of itself. And it also allows for the transfer of knowledge to be made more efficiently. So if you've captured current state, it's very easy then to transfer the knowledge that you have, say, to uh, a new hire, or if you're looking to grow a team and you need to bring on new individuals from within the org, it really helps them get up to speed more quickly. Uh, another benefit of capturing the current state is the ability to troubleshoot problems more effectively. So when you have taken the time to um, 
model out or capture what you have in front of you, it's very easy to pull that up and actually point to where in the process or where in your capability or where in your systems that a problem is occurring. So say someone called into the help desk and opened a ticket and they're experiencing this problem and it could be a, a very vague description of a certain application. Well, you may be able to pull up, um, you know, you may have at your disposal, once you've captured current state, is a multitude of processes and or, you know, points in that process where it could fail. And so then based on your information coming in from, say, that ticket, you're able to more to triage and, and more effectively pinpoint where that problem is. So you can go and focus your energy on fixing that problem rather than focusing on your energy, just trying to identify where is that problem within the general organization that you may be experiencing. Um, another benefit uh, of value is contractual. So as we move forward and into, into the, the years to come here, business, businesses are starting to work with their clients who may be wanting to be demanding more of the services that they get from the business. And so what I mean by that is some clients potentially may start to ask basic questions of, okay, so how are you going to meet my requests of you to you know, meet the end of your bargain? How are you gonna essentially um, meet the performance guarantees that have been provided? to me, right? And so one of the ways that clients could ask for that is, well, I'd, I'd like to see all of your end-to-end -end system documentation of how that's gonna impact me so that I know that you have all of this under control. So that's a potential down the, the road as well, um, but it's still kind of a hypothetical. It's, it purely could be to uh, another advantage where you may not be contractually obligated to do it, but it could become something as well where if you if a business has the business architecture in place, it could be seen as potentially a competitive advantage versus, say, another uh, competitor of theirs may not have uh, the ability to produce that documentation. So there's a couple of different benefits that could come from that one as well. So looking at the next, so defining the scope of what to include in an architecture. So really, um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of different uses for um, business architecture, but you know, ultimately it comes down to focusing more on what it is that you're delivering and less about how you're gonna be producing whatever the models or whatever, you know, per whatever framework you have. Um, because ultimately what business architecture can provide is accountability for capabilities. Um, it can help the business understand what is it even capable of achieving. Uh, it can help understand where they need to mature and uh, also helps them strategically plan for the future. So as you focus more on, on, on the what that you're going to be capturing, um, it's important to make sure that you define the scope of which areas that you are going to actually map out. And it helps to prioritize, right? So maybe some certain areas of your business are really in need of the architecture uh, first. It could be for various reasons. It could be for um, you know, handling risks or contractual ob obligations or performance is poor and trying to turn that around for the next year. It really just depends on what business, um, where the business is at and making sure that you're trying to provide architecture that provides the biggest value to your customer or client. And you do that by listening to what their problems are and really listening to what is it that they need so that you can provide them value versus getting too caught up, say, with like, using an exact framework or an exact model. It really helps to listen to what they have to say and meet them where they're at.
So uh, one way to do that is to, to really just ask them a couple of different questions, right? So which products and applications are going to be impacted? Um, you know, who are the points of contact for that? So you can get in touch with those individuals and have that personal uh, establish that rapport. Uh, it's very important to be, um, you know, people focused on this uh, effort, even though you are doing, uh, you know, essentially an activity where you're creating a, a, a tangible deliverable, it's very much people centric and what adds the most value to them. So there's kind of a balance of skills that you have to combine to be able to um, do business architecture very well. And so another thing to know is that if, if you're looking to start up a business architecture practice uh, and you're trying to gain that momentum within the org, um, you know, it doesn't hurt to improve on any existing frameworks or looking at any documentation that's currently in place so that you can come up with a way uh, of transferring knowledge uh, into a consumable format that could be repeatable um, and, and, and really try to drive towards a consistent service that you could provide to the business so that across departments, across whichever work streams or managers or leadership that you're working on, they'll start to see that there is a pattern or a recognizable format that people can get comfortable with. And that helps cross collaboration, even when you're not actively working with those individuals, if they happen to meet and they happen to each have been provided the architecture models of their processes, they can have a candid conversation and they would be able to see the others uh, processes and understand right away, or at least fairly quickly, um, get the idea of what they do and how they handle their area of the business. Okay, so I'll take a pause from there. We actually have another poll question number two. And so this question is, all our current state processes are documented. Is this true, false, or are you still unsure? Thanks to those that I see responding. I'm gonna give it another five seconds or so just to get the last minute responses in. All right, thank you. I will share the results. Okay, I see a few uh, responded uh, with a true. So that's great news to hear. Um, I think there's a lot of value in having those uh, processes documented. Uh, I see quite a few of you, the majority of you uh, noted false. Um, do not have current state processes documented. Some of you are unsure. And so, yeah, it's very common. Uh, I think it's just worth noting too, you know, current state, um, having it documented is, is one thing and it provides a lot of value, um, but there's some other pieces or supporting components to this that really help enhance um, what you can do with current state. So we'll talk about those in our next couple of sections. All right, so uh, moving forward. So if you happen to be, um, let's say we've gone through the exercise of capturing current state, um, you know, you've, you've found a way to get a consistent format uh, and deliver it to your, your client or customer, and let's, whether that be the, another department or, or management or what have you uh, for a certain work stream within your business. So the next, um, logical question to ask is, okay, so how can we define what future state looks like? And so the key question to ask is, okay, well, what's the business case for defining future state? So the business is going to have ideas on how to improve, and they're likely going to have a vision on what good looks like. And so having the ability to capture that vision in a visual that's easy for people to articulate 
is only going to enhance your ability to actually achieve your goal and actually motivate and engage with the right people to get that to where you're going. So naturally, uh, as you look at your current state processes and you watch through that exercise, you're going to find ways uh, or you're going to find pieces of it, let's say, that you're not satisfied with or that you immediately recognize could be improved upon. So really, one of the goals in the, of the exercise going through defining future state is giving you that opportunity to voice what you as the, let's say you are the process owner or that you're the subject matter expert of this area of the business. It gives you a voice to say where in the process, where in the business could we improve upon and not just say, oh, I want to make this better, but it can provide a platform for you to articulate, okay, this is where we're at. I think if we did this, this way, we could improve our processes or this capability within the business. And you could capture that as part of the architecture deliverable so that when you go to articulate it to other areas of the business, they'll be able to see immediately where, where can we improve and how can we explore or discover areas, uh, ways, how can we come up with the best solution to meet that need. And so there's a couple of different ways that it could be improved upon. So if you're looking at your process, you know, and you're trying to align it with what you know you're hearing, maybe say from the business, let's just say that there's some technical requirements. Let's say um, you have to be able to, let's say there's a new law that got passed, okay, and it came with certain uh, requirements and your business had to react to it. Well, you could actually outline in your process uh, exactly where those requirements are, and you could actually even tie them to whatever uh, document you were provided or you know, categorization um, of that exact requirement so that you can trace it through your organization of how you're gonna, one, meet the needs of that requirement in that contract, uh, and two, identify areas that you have to change to be able to meet that requirement. So that's where future state would be uh, very beneficial. Another one is, okay, let's say you've captured current state and you're looking forward to next year. What kind of business outcomes do you wanna see? What the business ultimately has to pick a direction um, one over the other. So for example, does the business wanna be more flexible? Okay, well, how can we make these processes be more adaptable across areas and departments of our business? Um, do we need our processes to be more secure? Where can I put the exact technology or controls in place to ensure that we have a greater level of security within our processes? Or are we just looking to be more cost effective? Where in the process are we losing uh, or not, uh, not efficiently uh, running? And where are we not generating the highest profits? Where can we cut costs on ways uh, maybe we're, the process is too inefficient and it's wasteful. How can we improve that or skinny down the process or automate things that are manual to speed this up to lead to higher profits? Um, another uh, item could just be, you know, what are the best practices? What is, the, what is your industry seeing over the last year or a few months? Or, you know, what are the trends? How are you going to implement best practices? into your processes and the people that are running that process. So once you've identified, you know, kind of a future state where, again, I guess I should clarify. So future state could be any time frame into the future, right? It doesn't just have to be a year. It could be five years, 10 years. It could be, you know, a few weeks from now. But as people look to articulate where they want to be, once you get that captured, then you now have two, the two critical components to be able to do essentially a gap analysis, right? Like we just mentioned, some of the things you could be 
looking for that where your business wants to go is just really trying to pull up your current state, your future state and see, okay, where are there differences? Where, how can we actually bridge this gap and get to where we're trying to go? So how do you envision your future state supporting your overall strategy? And it allows you, once you have those you know, two endpoints, you can essentially create a roadmap of how you're gonna get there, right? And you could put milestones along the way of the key deliverables you wanna accomplish, say in your first milestone, your first chunk of the business or a task or a process that you wanted to improve upon. And you can do those in milestones, you know, one, two, three, four, however many, until you get to that overall future state end goal that you're driving towards. And so really that's key. Uh, one of the key ways to get that is to make sure that you're listening and that you're gathering all that input from all of the relevant people who are involved in the process so that you can ensure that the strategy is meaning is, is resonating. You can ensure that the models you're producing are providing value and, and really just driving the overall success of the business. And so I think what's, what's great about the opportunity to have the future state represented is it's really kind of, it's kind of a, a shift in mindset. Current state's very almost black and white in front of you. And then future state's a little more abstract and it may not always necessarily be um, completely um, defined, but it, it'll at least be an attempt to get it where you want to go. And I think what's nice about that is it just gives kind of more of the taps into more of the human nature of just wanting to improve on what's already been created and really listening as you listen to others and, and they start to see the value, it empowers them to stretch into a space of possibilities and envision what is the business capable of. And I've seen this, you know, inspire people in the process. So I, I find that to be a very rewarding piece of, of working through these, these components. Yep, so we talked about how that envision, how that vision, uh, the process and the strategy work together. So another component there is, okay, let's say you have the current state, let's say you have the future state defined. How are you going to actually handle, um, now that you've essentially created this cycle, eventually future state, you would reach, let's say you, you reach the end, you reach the target, and then that becomes your current state. So naturally, your next iteration will be to define, okay, what does future state look like now? Because future state is now our current state um, as we've gone into the future, right? So you've created a life cycle essentially of how you'll iterate to continue to improve the business. So how do you work through that? So how does the, how does the, the architecture continually support the strategic vision? So one of the key things you need to do for your team, uh, for your architecture practice, is making sure that you define all of the specific tasks and roles uh, and data flows and you know, ways that you have, have your workflow through your team. And it's really kind of a chance. Uh, I've seen uh, what makes the most sense is the ability to basically put your money where your mouth is and turn around and use business architecture on your own team to actually define, listen to your own team once you have a clear idea of how you're creating these repeatable, consistent uh, deliverables and turn it in on yourself and map out all the processes that you use to do business architecture. And that's sometimes a challenging mindset to flip through, but it's ultimately very rewarding. Um, and if anyone ever asks, okay, how does your team do this? It's, it's, a, it's a way of validating to others, okay, there's, val there's value in creating uh, a business architecture model for every process, including our own. And so the next thing, you know, making sure that you You've, you've created this, uh, this kind of engine of knowing, okay, this is what we do. This is, this is who's going to do it, under what organization. These are the actions that they're gonna take. 
uh, then you really want to look to make sure that you're communicating your processes out to your stakeholders and you really want to open up a channel for communication with those departments or with those teams, uh, your client customer, um, your internal clients customers, so that they can provide to you, okay, well, when, when we make a change or when we have an update or when, you know, let's say we, we have a new way of, of notifying uh, what things have changed. There's a new, there's now an automated part to this, not a manual. You need to have that channel clearly defined with your stakeholder that you're working with so that they feel empowered to communicate to you when there is a change. So you can work collaboratively with them and make sure again that you're meeting them at their needs where they're at. So I say that because it, it could really depend and vary on, on how often something changes or the size of the department or the size of the work stream. You know, do you want to revisit this in you know three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months? You know, there's really no set answer, but what there is that you can do, what you're empowered to do is really listen to what those people on that team are going to need to add the most value. And so you can, you can establish a, 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 a cadence, let's call it, for revisiting the architecture um, after a certain amount of time. But I think it's also super critical, like I said, to make sure that you have that communication channel up in between if there are any changes that they're feeding that information to you so that you um, can meet them again uh, and update their, their uh, models accordingly. Uh, another key part here is the ability to incorporate business architecture into the annual strategic planning. So a lot of businesses look at their strategy for, say, the next 12 months or the next calendar year, depending on uh, the business. I feel strongly that having the business architecture as a key component to that strategic planning and not just something that gets tacked on or added on or another presentation to be brought into the strategic planning. I think it honestly needs to be part of the planning because it really helps calibrate uh, and dial into what parts of your business are going to align to whatever strategies you're going to be pursuing for that next 12 months. It can allow teams and empower them to be able to listen to the strategy for the year, look at their process, processes in front of them, and start to highlight or pinpoint or just articulate this part of my process needs to change from this to this if you want to support this strategic vision. So we talked about how that supports the strategic vision. Uh, we do have another poll question for you. So for this one, uh, my architecture is updated on a regular cadence. Is that true, false, or unsure? I'm seeing the responses come in. I'm going to give it another five seconds or so. All right, thank you, everybody. I will share the results. Okay, so we have a couple of uh, people who said that yes, it is updated regularly. We have um, quite a few people who have noted uh, false and quite a few noted unsure. So one of the, I think one of it's worth calling out, you know, one of the, one of the benefits of having an architecture practice in place is that you have a dedicated team to ensure that the models are up to date. And I'll, I'll admit that's probably one of the largest challenges that a team could face. Um, as you, let's say you've captured current state, you've, you've been able to capture a future state and articulate it and work towards that vision. One of the one of the key things that I guess can happen or things that it's easy to slide into is a model that's current state 
can start to kind of be feel outdated, right? It could even already, there could have been a change going relatively quickly compared to go going to the future state. And so as you look to update those models, that's where it's, it's extra important and critical that you have those channels open with those subject matter experts who, who can tell you, okay, this has changed. You can, you can manage that backlog of items that have changed. And then when you go to meet with them again, you can work um, with them to incorporate that into your model. And having that established cadence or, or having that open channel is really gonna help you meet their business needs and be able to react to them and, and ensure that you have the most up-to-date models. All right, so one of the, the last uh, items here or remaining items I have here. So talking about how to quantify your process, this is really, uh, I think, one of the greatest value drivers of doing a business architecture practice is if you are going to be taking the time to capture current state, you're going to be taking the time to capture future state, and you're taking the time to ensure that all the pieces are working together in the interim to meet those needs. As you are working through all of that and you're having all of these conversations with people who know their processes like the back of their hand, uh, they're going to have certain inputs. They're gonna have opinions. They're gonna have thoughts. They're gonna have feedback. And so, as they work through their processes, there's a few different ways to think about how you could quantify your process so that you could articulate how can we improve, how can we um, identify opportunities for, let's say, potential savings or profit generations. Uh, what can we do to really help drive that? And so you can even do that in a way where it pinpoints down to say the activity level of what, what your model's articulating. So this could be an individual um, you know, running a process uh, within an organization. Uh, you're pinpointing the exact activities that they're taking. You could even articulate, okay, if this activity was done a little differently, it would lead to cost savings and profit generations. Now you're having a conversation that if you were to articulate to leadership, uh, uh, you know, let's say a business case for investing a small amount to make this change, you're, you're articulating to that individual more specifically in your business, where exactly in your business could you improve versus saying, okay, well, somewhere in this department, how do we know if we can, you know, how can we improve? It's, it, takes, it takes the items that are abstract and makes them a lot more explicit by putting it to, into a visual that people can articulate and, and understand. So one way to do that is just ask, okay, so are there any manual processes that could be automated, right? So as you're, as you're going ahead and mapping out these business processes, you may, you're, gonna, you're gonna indicate, is this process being done manually? Is it being done automatically by a system? You know, if it's a, a person interacting with an application or a system, you can note that system. So at, at some point you're gonna come across manual tasks and just naturally ask yourself, hey, what, if, what can be automated here? Can this be automated? How much money would that save us? Uh, you know, annually or you know, monthly, weekly, daily. Um, another item as you map these out is, okay, are there any redundancies in the process? Are we having two people run and do the exact same activities when only one person needs to be doing it? Um, it's a very common um, thing once you see on, in the deliverable, right, on the map, uh, to be able to look at it and say, well, wait a minute, what if this person does this and does that? Um, yeah, so just thinking how many hours would be saved? How many... How many hours of, of people working um, on a certain task could be saved uh, if we could reduce that? And then if there's any errors, how many errors could, are occurring? Let's say there's 
um, you know, there's a certain error report uh, being ran. Do we even know what those errors are so that we can reduce them? Can we quantify that? Is that an opportunity in and of itself to be able to bring that to our attention? And then from there, can we look at those and do an analysis on the types of problems we're seeing, see if there's a pattern that we could cut down on. Another part is just looking at what parts of our processes are vulnerable to risk. So just asking yourselves, okay, so this is the process today. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, what, where do we see that the process could fail? What's the worst case scenario that could happen here? Do we have any compliance affecting this process? Are we out of compliance potentially if certain scenarios hit uh, from the way we're doing the process today? Uh, is there any place where human error could occur that we could put something in place that could prevent that? Um, and even just simply asking, what about this process keeps you up at night? Uh, yeah, so looking at pain points, what's, again, just kind of elaborating on that. So it's a little bit different from, let's say, a risk. Um, just what, let's say you're doing a process. Um, you know, there's a performer, someone's working through it, doing these activities. What are the things that are their biggest challenges that they face on a daily basis or weekly basis? Um, what have they already done to address this? So as you're interviewing or talking to these individuals, you know, you're having these conversations about what, what is most painful about your process and what have you already done to try and fix it? That kind of information capture alone can help people problem solve by starting farther along uh, to try and solve some of these pain point problems. So what happens if the problem goes unresolved? Are you going to have, you know, decreased morale um, for having to do a process that is viewed as unnecessary or you know, time consuming or um, draining on, on the team's resources and time. Another one is looking at knowledge gaps. So as the team's talking about, okay, well, this is how I do this and that, but I don't really know much about that. Okay, so tell me more about that. Do we know what data is being passed through this process? Um, are there, you know, any sort of metrics or reporting done on this process? to help us gain insights to what's going on. And how do you measure success? Okay, just because we captured a process here and people are doing it, doesn't mean it's necessarily working the way it was intended. What can we do about that? How can we capture that information? And then there's also uh, just the opportunity points. So one of the things you can ask yourself is, is this process truly harnessing technology, right? So if you are utilizing people, technology in your business, do we have an opportunity to improve that? What is ideal for this process? How can we ensure that we're, we're doing this process as efficiently as possible for our business? What needs to take place or be implemented to improve that process? It could really be any number of things uh, at looking how, where are those opportunity points? So where can we grow? Um, what is possible? What's missing? So really, um, you know, oftentimes in business, making decisions on how to improve can be challenging, but finding a way to bring clarity and context to those decisions is a great way to ensure that you're considering the best path forward. And business architecture can help you do that. Okay, um, as a reminder, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature of the Zoom webinar. Um, and Brandon, we actually have a few questions. Um, the first two I think are somewhat related. Um, the first question is, is where within an organization does a business architecture practice typically exist? Yeah, that's a great question. So 
I would say typically I've seen, uh, you know, within organizations, it, it would really make sense to have a business architecture practice within technology. Uh, since a lot of components are going to be, you're going to be interacting with technology and business, um, but being closer to the technology side and having those systems applications, um, uh, you know, closer by, let's say, and more familiar. Um, it's also, a, you know, it's a, it's a technology centric world. So a lot of individuals will interact with technology and it's really important to capture the, you know, the people and the technology into a combined holistic view of how they're both interacting together. So it does, it, I would say it takes both, um, but technology tends to be, um, I think a better fit for where it should live. Great, and I think the one that's related to that too is for business architecture processes. And I think from a participation standpoint, does it matter where you sit within an organization? Yeah, no, I, I would think, you know, ultimately, I don't think it, sh it shouldn't matter too much. I, as in, I guess the way I, I'm perceiving this question is, um, you know, uh, my response would be every, in my opinion, everyone would be interacting with business architecture. So having, having that team familiar with as many people within the organization as possible and having a rapport with them, I would see that as being ideal. So everyone really kind of has a place within architecture practices. So when you capture who's doing what, you make sure that you're capturing the role function within an organization and, and giving them that voice to speak to how they do uh, their processes and carry them out within the organization. Great. Uh, next question, can you expand a little bit more on what processes are valuable to document and keep up to date? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is really, I would say, it, it comes back to, um, listening to your client and your customer. So having that, that kind of discovery meeting, let's say way up front before you even say, I'm going to, I'm going to accomplish this many models in the next, you know, six months or what have you having that conversation with them to, to really understand, okay, what are their core processes that they're looking to document so that they can have a clear view of each of those let's call them sections of their process or sections or processes of their team. So there's, I would say really, it's, it's ultimately up to that person who owns all those processes or you know, the, the leadership over the teams to de help determine what's most valuable and, and should be mapped versus other processes that may not need to be mapped. Um, next question is, is, do you have a business case that you can share where this approach worked well? And then even on the opposite side of the spectrum, where is it maybe not a good fit to apply the approach? Yeah, so let's, I mean, let's start with an example of where it's worked. So I've seen it work really well um, with a client who has a contractual requirement uh, that need to be met so that they could articulate how the technology and business work to meet the needs uh, of a client. So it really helped them. It really helped them meet that need contractually. But I will say more so than that, um, in the interim, uh, when we when when we started this practice and we started to, let's say, get our consistent format dialed in and, and provided our first, let's say, you know, full set of, of deliverables to the client actually uh, dramatically increased uh, their standing with the client and completely turned around the client relationship that they had with them. At the time, it was very rocky. Um, they were not quite pleased with performance. So once we were able to provide this as a deliverable and, you know, on the flip side or a continuation from that would be that the, the business and technology who own that process were more clearly able to articulate to someone on the outside uh, looking in what it is that they're doing to support uh, that client. And it, it dramatically changed their relationship. Um, 
so I've, I've seen that work quite effectively um, in that regard. Um, also, I've seen it, you know, it's helped teams um, sunset and old tech technology um, and then understand, okay, well, if we're gonna get rid of this old component, right, this old system, then how's that gonna impact things that are around it or downstream? So that really helped, um, that was kind of hand in hand with getting a better client relationship was being able to capture all of that information, sunset an old system that was a pain point and helped us understand where we needed to improve and articulate what we're doing to improve so that the relationship turned around. Um, so for an example of where this would not be uh, good to use, it's, I mean, I'll say this, it, that's a challenging question because I would say as I, the more and more, I'd say the more that you work in business architecture and the more you stretch yourself into that mindset, you almost start to see how the world operates and processes or capabilities. And so, I mean, I could see there being value to almost all of them, but it, at the end of the day, if it's not adding value to your life or it's not adding value to the client or if you're too focused on the framework or doing things a certain way down to the T um, for a client and, and you're less focused on what their needs are, I'd say that's when it becomes kind of less valuable or not the best place. So, but I would say if you're working through that, you know, take the feedback, try to incorporate, try to improve upon it and, and try to meet them uh, you know, and find the format that works best for them. Great. A few more questions. Um, does business architecture foster innovation or differentiation? Let's see here. I would definitely say so. I mean, I would say, um, you know, I, I mean, I'll even just use this as an example, you know, I've been actively developing a, a model, um, you know, with the business and technology on the call. And, you know, every just light bulbs went off in everyone's head and they just said, oh, we're doing it that way today. I, you know, and then someone in business, you know, not picking on any side, I just, I think someone said, oh, well, I've been doing this every day. Isn't that what I'm supposed to be doing? And then someone in technology who, you know, those two individuals don't get a chance to interact much. Someone raised their hand, you know, and spoke up and it's like, well, no, actually it's set up right now to do it this way. You don't have to do that at all. You know, those, those types of like immediate value recognitions of, of how, how we could immediately cut waste and improve the process can sometimes just happen like holistically right in the moment when you have people um, collaborating on a call. So I'd say they definitely help with innovation. Great. Uh, next question, is business architecture needed for smaller organizations that have a flat management style? Yeah, I, I could see there being a value to, you know, really any size organization. And, you know, I would say, you know, it really, it really comes down to what would add the most value to your business. So, you know, if, if you don't necessarily need a full on dedicated team or a full on, you know, um, specific like architecture method per se for your business, you know, try to right size it to what makes sense to you to add value. So having an ability to articulate your processes, no matter how big or small they are, you know, having them defined will only lead to better conversations amongst yourself uh, or, you know, amongst employees. Um, and it also might help define, you know, what your business isn't trying to do. You know, I would think small businesses are trying to do a very specific set of tasks. So having those defined can also just help you understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish and help you focus your time on what you shouldn't be doing so that you can do the best you possibly can with the processes that you do have and wanna be successful with. 
And it looks like we've got one final question. Um, that is, what if your current state varies by each individual? Interesting, yeah. I mean, I think what's, what's nice is that, I mean, if you have that type of scenario, um, I'm not sure how many different people would have different um, perspectives. I know you can always, you know, take the time to meet with them individually and, and map out their perspectives. Um, you could also do kind of a, an, a, an analysis of each of those perspectives to see if there's any patterns or carryover um, to what they have. But, you know, ultimately I would just say, you know, make sure that you keep an open mind and that you're listening and pro providing people an opportunity to speak and, and tell you what they think about the process and do your best to capture it so that uh, you can grow from there. Wonderful. That is all the questions we have. So on behalf of Brandon and Digineer, I'd like to thank everybody for joining. This concludes our webinar today. Please look for the recordings of our webinars on our YouTube channel and be sure to follow us on our social media channels. Also, if you do have any additional questions, please send an email to info at Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.